Welcome to the Lesbian Review Podcast. I'm Sheena and I'm joined today by Michelle, a reviewer at the Lesbian Review, and we're going to talk about 10 best female leads in a horror movie. Michelle, thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. So I'm super excited because nobody ever wants to talk horror movies with me. And it's one of my particular fondnesses. Like, I really love a good horror. And I know it's technically not lesbian because, frankly, let's face it, I don't think any lesbian horror movies worth anything have ever been made. So we're going to go with the next best thing, which is female leads. Sounds good. Alrighty. I'm going to start with my first choice, and then we're going to move across to your first choice. And we're going to alternate through the show. We're going to talk a little bit about why we love that particular film and who plays that role. Okay. So my first choice is Annie from The Gift. Have you watched The Gift? Actually, no, I haven't seen that movie. Kate Blanchett plays Annie, and it's this dark and twisty kind of tale. It's actually an interesting thing because I was doing some research about this. So The Gift was made in 2000, and it's a supernatural thriller, and it's done by Sam Raimi, written by Billy Bob Thornton. So it's kind of like a like Sam Raimi was involved in Xena, so there's a whole connection there. So of course, you know, this has to be a cool film. Yes. And then it's got Kate Blanchett in it. So of course, Victoria, also a reviewer at the Lesbian Review, is going to be doing a happy dance because... All things Kate Blanchett are great. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? All right, so basically what the story is about, I'm going to read the synopsis. In the town of Brixton, Georgia, widow Annie Wilson is the resident fortune teller. Jessica King, the fiancée of a local school teacher, Wayne Collins, disappears. Annie receives a vision revealing that Jessica has been killed and that her corpse is thrown into a pond. She informs the local sheriff of her vision and despite his scepticism, he searches the pond at the home of Donnie Barksdale, the violent husband of one of Annie's clients. Donnie has previously threatened Annie and her kids and he's a really violent man. I actually don't want to go too much further because I don't want to spoil it for you, but let's say this is a dark and twisty story with ghostly kind of visions it's fantastic you should absolutely watch this film so yay dark and twisty i'll definitely have to add that onto my list of movies to watch i think unfortunately this is one of those films that's very underrated so it's not top of mind but it's such an excellent film okay so what is your first one so the first movie that i chose was species from 1995 I chose this movie because sometimes it's the best B-movies aren't really meant to be B-movies. And I'm pretty sure the intention was not for this movie to be campy, but (laughs) it's kind of a masterpiece in campiness. Given the cast, there was Forrest Whitaker, Marg Helgenberger, and Ben Kingsley were all in it. So pretty sure they weren't intending to go for that kind of vibe, but that's how it came out. The special effects aren't really great in it, but there are some great groan-inducing one-liners. And one scene where tentacles actually come out of Sill's nipples to strangle someone, which is kind of awful, but in a good way. The main reason I actually picked this one, though, is because the uh, lead female character is, is the villain in this movie. So for the plot, we get to see a female lead that's the villain. Basically, scientists receive a transmission from outer space that gives instructions on how to fuse alien DNA with human DNA. So what could possibly go wrong with that? Um, They decide to use female human DNA because uh, females are more docile and easier to control, which is a completely reasonable assumption. So one of the experiments is successful, and they end up with a female-looking child that they call Syl. Um, And Syl develops rapidly, aging 12 years and 3 months. Um, but she starts exhibiting some pretty violent outbursts um, and horrible nightmares. So after much deliberation, the scientists decide to rethink the whole idea, and the safest thing to do is to kill her. Uh, Syl manages to escape, and the scientists are forced to enlist an interesting ensemble to track her down and kill her before she starts wreaking some serious havoc on uh, the population. After escaping, um, there's a good cocooning period on a train, and Syl matures into a gorgeous and deadly woman, and everyone's biggest fear is that she's going to head out into the world and propagate. I think you're right when you say it's fabulously campy. (laughs) And you're absolutely right about the cast. When I watched this movie, I was actually surprised 
that that cast was in this film. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think they were too. <laughs> okay. So my second one is Emily Rose from The Exorcism of Emily Rose, played by Jennifer Carpenter. Have you seen The Exorcism of Emily Rose? I have um, quite some time ago, though, so this will be a good refresher. The story is about Emily Rose, a 19-year-old American teenager. She dies of self-inflicted wounds and malnutrition following an attempted exorcism. People say she was possessed by seven demons. Father Richard Moore, the Catholic diocesan priest who attempted the exorcism, is arrested and sent to court. While the archdiocese wants more to, more to plead guilty to minimize the crime's public attention, he instead plans to plead not guilty. And so what's so fascinating about this film is you get the kind of horror elements of the flashbacks of what's happening interspersed with the trial and the various people telling the story of Emily Rose. It wasn't a very high-budget film, but it was a very well-done film. Fun fact, this film is loosely based on the story of Annalise Mitchell and follows a self-proclaimed agnostic who acts as a defense counsel representing a parish priest accused by the state of negligent homicide after he performed an exorcism on her. So it's very loosely based on an actual case. Well, that's always cool. I think a lot of kind of possession ones are based on on some sort of real life scenario. The amalgamation of the kind of courtroom drama with the horror elements was just phenomenal. It was a, a really great portrayal as well of Emily Rose and this tortured this tortured woman who still to this day I'm not I don't know was she con- was she in fact possessed or was she you know going through some psychological craziness. It's it's a f- fascinating. Okay, so what's your next one? Uh, so my next one is Ginger Snaps, which was made in the year 2000. I chose this one partially because it's Canadian, so I wanted to throw a little hometown pride into the discussion. But also this one was another good mix of horror and comedy for me, which had a bunch of fantastic one-liners as well. And of course, there's the whole werewolf concept, which I absolutely love. So it's about two teenage sisters, Bridget and Ginger, which kind of reminded me of myself when I was in my teens, listening to like Bauhaus and rocking the black leather. Um, They have a morbid fascination with death and are also spend a lot of time creating different gory death scenes and taking pictures using themselves as models. Because of their morbidity, they are ostracized by their classmates, teachers, and pretty much everybody else in town. It doesn't really phase them because they have each other, and as long as they have each other to rely on, they're good. It starts with quite a few gory scenes in terms of neighborhood dogs that are horrifically maimed and killed, which, you know, bothered me a little because I'm kind of a dog person, but... It definitely sets up the gore that is coming in the rest of the movie. One night, Bridget and Ginger come across the mangled remains of a dog, and while they're investigating it, they're attacked by some sort of creature. Ginger is bitten and scratched up pretty badly, but Bridget manages to fight the beast off, grab her sister, and run away. The creature chases them as they flee, but is absolutely destroyed by a van crossing the highway. Ginger heals pretty quickly from her wounds, but starts to undergo changes in her body and her temperament. One of the funnier aspects of this is um, she starts growing a little tail, which was quite humorous to watch, actually. Uh, She becomes extremely rash and flies off the handle a lot and, of course, hypersexual. The transformation begins to take its toll on the sister's relationship. Bridget's afraid of what her sister is becoming and tries desperately to find a cure before it's too late. The special effects aren't particularly amazing in this movie, but... I think the werewolf was still pretty effective in generating that kind of fear and loathing that one expects in a horror movie. There's a few different kinds of horrors actually at play in this one. There's the whole fear of being different that the sisters are dealing with on a daily basis. And it's mixed with the whole puberty issue and fear of social acceptance. So, but Of course, then there's the werewolf aspect too, which I found pretty cool. It's uh, not only trying to kill people but it really wants to tear them apart as well Uh, so it creates a lot of gory scenes okay i haven't watched that one but it sounds interesting (laughs) i actually really enjoyed it um especially the little comedic interactions between the girl's parents and stuff it was funny but also horrific when when the werewolf actually comes out so are you a five moons rising addict 
I think I've established that I'm a an addict of everything that Lise McKay writes, but uh, I do love <laughs> Five Moons Rising, yes. <laughs> you know she's working on the next one. I've seen that. I can't wait. Okay, so my, my next one is Joanna Mills from the movie The Return. She's played by Sarah Michelle Gellar. Okay, so Joanna Mills is a traveling rep for a trucking company, and she's dedicated to her successful career, but something of a loner. Since the age of 11, she's been a troubled person with episodes of self-mutilation and menacing visions. Normally, she avoids returning to her native Texas, but agrees to a trip there to secure an important client. During the trip, her visions, which take the form of memories of events not from her life, increase in intensity, and she sees a strange face staring back at her in the mirror. So she has to deal with all of this and to figure out what's going on with her and solve the problem, if you like. Fun fact, the DVD version contains an alternate ending to this film. So have you watched this one? Actually, I haven't seen that one either. Um, and that's surprising because I love Sarah Michelle Gellar. I'm obviously picking these films that are they were never huge box office hits and so on, but I think they're kind of these amazing films that people are not necessarily aware of. But I love I love ferreting around in those those sections and, and finding the, the unusual diamonds, the ones that are really great films that just never quite caught on. Yeah, definitely. Usually uh, I'd say that that's kind of where I tend to go as well, but more in terms of science fiction than, than horror. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see that with you. Science fiction for me is a very hit or miss sort of scenario. So like I'll either love it or uh, not much. <laughs> so, like, don't tell anybody, but I'm actually not a huge Star Wars fan. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I grew up on Star Wars. Okay, so what's your, what's your next one? So my next one is The Descent from 2005. Is this the caving one? Yes. Yes, I've watched this one. Okay. So, so yeah, the reason I picked it is because it's right up my alley since I'm an avid outdoor person and love exploring. So I couldn't resist a movie about a group of women going exploring in a cave. Uh, I've been in a few situations during some of my nature trips, which I've been a little freaked out in. Between the isolation, uh, the low chance of rescue and just like deafening silence that you get out there. Uh, it's definitely the uh, overactive imagination can add a, a very sinister feeling to that. So this movie I found doubled up on the horror in that way. There's um, the tension of being trapped in a cave. Um, it's dark and they're lost. Not sure how they're going to get out. And then add to that the fact that, of course, there's these horrific creatures that also dwell in the caves. So this movie definitely creeps into my head from time to time when I'm out traipsing in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the movie begins with an awful tragedy. Heading home after a whitewater rafting trip, the main character, Sarah's family, is involved in a horrific car accident. Both her husband and her daughter are immediately killed in this accident, and it's, it's pretty graphic. Um, Sarah awakens in a hospital alone, and there's this great scene as she kind of tears out the tubes that are all attached to her and she flees from the hospital bed and she's running down the hall and it's like the walls are getting darker as she's running down the hall, eventually kind of blacking everything out behind her. Um, so fast forward a year from that and Sarah and her girlfriends decide they're going to meet up for a spelunking uh, caving adventure in a remote cave. Shortly after they descend into the cave, there is a collapse that seals off the entrance. Discovering that not only do they not have a map, but are also in a different set of caves than they thought they were going to be in, the women begin to argue and panic, uh, realizing that the only thing the group can do to escape is head deeper into the caves. They push forward, searching for another way out. As they move through the caves, one of the women thinks she sees a way out and throwing caution to the wind, she runs forward and ends up falling down a hole, um, breaking her leg, which is the worst thing you can do when you're hiking. Trust me, <laughs> never rush. Um, while helping her, their friend, one of the women spots a creature that they can't really make out nearby, uh, but it quickly disappears. Shortly afterwards, however, the women are attacked by the creature, 
uh, I believe they called them crawlers, and are now not only in a race to find their way out of the caves, but also to escape the awful creatures that dwell within them. Because it's filmed almost entirely underground, it was super dark, and all the lighting comes from headlamps and flares, which really added to the kind of scariness of the movie as well. And they combine a bunch of little jump scares into it, so, you know, you have, like, bats flying at you, and that that makes you kind of jump out of your seat on top of the creatures. So I really enjoyed this one. I really don't want to get too much into the story because it's easy to spoil it, but uh, there's two kind of main characters. Juno, who's strong, competent, but also pretty flawed. There's a few moments where you're just amazed at her ability to take control of the situation and save the day, but then there's other moments where you're totally awestruck at what she did. And then Sarah's very interesting, but I don't want to give too much away of the story. Her character does progress as they push through the cave. She goes from being traumatized, scared, and not very confident to a crawler killing machine. Uh, This one also has two separate, there's an American and a European ending to it, kind of taking it in two a little bit different directions, but I really enjoyed this one. So which ending was better, the American one or the European one? European. I thought I thought the American one it gave you it gave you like a little kind of flash of horror, but it, the European ending added like a whole new dimension to the rest of the movie. So you'd have to go back and think about the whole movie over again once you once you saw that one. Uh, okay, got it. Nice layers. All right, so my next one, which is my fourth one, is Heather Donahue from the Blair Witch Project, played by. Heather Donahue. So the Blair Witch Project was such a fascinating film because it just blew up the whole world of filmmaking. I was actually a film student at the time and I remember just being amazed by what this film managed to do with such a tiny budget. It was crazy, right? So the premise is, in October 1994, film students Heather, Mike and Josh set out to produce a documentary about the fabled Blair Witch. They travel to Burkittsville, Maryland, and interview residents about the legend. Then they hike up into the forest to go find some clues that the residents told them about. And they end up getting lost in the forest, and they end up getting, like, stalked by someone or something. And it's this crazy journey. It is scary as hell. It's brilliantly shot. This is one hell of a fault. Agreed. I love that movie. Fun fact about this film, it grossed nearly a quarter billion dollars on a $35,000 budget. Um, So if you have not watched The Blair Witch Project, you have to watch The Blair Witch Project because it actually was the seed film for so many types of genre, of horror genres that, uh, you know, exist today that didn't exist before The Blair Witch Project. So brilliant, groundbreaking stuff. The one thing I actually love the most about that is you didn't, you never really knew what you're afraid of, <laughs> which is the best thing. It's like, I'm afraid of everything right now. Exactly. It's a tree. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a rock. It's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am kind of afraid of rock sometimes, but that's more of a climbing issue. <laughs> uh, okay. What is your number four? So my number four is kind of a a sci-fi horror blend, um, Alien, uh, from 1979. I love that movie. I love Sigourney Weaver. Um, (laughs) So yeah, I chose this one just because it's such a perfect mashup between science fiction and horror. It begins with the crew of a spaceship being woken from stasis uh, far earlier than they should have been. Their ship had picked up a distress call and the crew is under obligation to investigate any kind of signs of life that it comes across. While looking into the origin of the SOS, which they still don't completely understand as an SOS, it's more just the message they've picked up, they discover a chamber full of large eggs in in the belly of the ship they're investigating. One of the crew members touches one and is immediately attacked by an alien creature, which I think everybody has seen the image of the face sucker that jumps onto his face and attaches. 
Uh, it still gives me the chills. Eventually, they manage to remove the creature uh, from the uh, cane, is the character's name's face, and apart from a little memory loss, he seems to be okay. Later on is one of my favorite scenes in the movie when the crew is having their last meal before going back into stasis. And all of a sudden, Kane starts choking and convulsing on the table, and his uh, stomach erupts and the creature bursts out of his torso, uh, manages to escape and disappear into the ship. The crew begin searching for the ship and, of course, split up and all that good stuff that happens in horror movies. Uh, it, and the creature's grown at a at a rapid rate, and it's now a huge and terrifying beast, and uh, they're in the fight of their lives to kill it before it destroys them all. Um, the special effects were pretty amazing in this movie, uh, especially considering when it was made, and the the iconic f- figure of the alien, even this day, I still kind of... I'm like, wow, that's freaky. <laughs> and Sigourney Weaver is is just amazing as Ripley. She's intelligent, competent, brave as hell, and takes charge and kicks butt on uh, several occasions in the movie. Totally true. What a fantastic film. And it's still today is one hell of a film to watch. Like, uh, I don't feel like it's aged that significantly, that it's not a fun film to watch still. And scary as hell. And one of the reasons it's so scary is you don't ever see the alien fully yes because because you couldn't because they had to shoot it because it was all puppetry and stuff so they you know they they didn't have the technology to do the the stuff that they can do today and i think because of that it was scarier i think the element of not knowing and not being able to see fully makes the film more exciting jaws was the same thing yeah definitely i mean it's it's worse when you're not kind of told what you're looking at is scary and you have to kind of fill in the blanks yourself. Exactly. I think our brains are much scarier than anything (laughs) real. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, so my last one is Dr. Susan Tyler from Mimic, played by Mara Sorvino. Have you watched Mimic? I have, yes. Okay. Did you know that Mimic was directed by Guillermo del Toro? I did not know that. Yes, it was his first full-length um, film for the English audience. I actually found this out the other day, and I thought it was f- fascinating. Mimic is about... Oh, Mimic is a, is a creature film. It's fabulous. In Manhattan, cockroaches are spreading the deadly Strickler's disease. that's claiming hundreds of the city's children. Dr. Susan Tyler is recruited to see if she can figure out what's going on with the cockroaches, and they create a kind of a bug that kills the cockroaches, basically. Things go very, very wrong down the line, though, and people start being killed. I don't actually want to ruin the plot for anybody, but it's it's a creepy film. She ends up in the abandoned subway system, being chased by monsters, and it's great fun. It's always a, there's always something going wrong in the subway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I drive. I don't know if I could commute in those enclosed, freaky places. That's true. Okay, so what is your last one? So my last pick is my absolute favorite movie of really any genre ever, um, Resident Evil. It's the first one made in 2002. I love the entire franchise, and not just because it was based on a video game, although that's always a, a bonus in my books, but because Mila Jovovich portrays one of the most you know, butt-kicking women I've ever seen in the genre, um, other than Ripley. I think the two are kind of even for me. Um, but also zombies. I don't know why, but I have a total thing for zombies. <laughs> um, Walking Dead is one of my favorite shows. Uh, so this movie begins in an underground research facility that's run by the Umbrella Corporation, known as The Hive. Uh, A vial is broken, unleashing an unknown substance into the air ducts. In order to contain the situation, the facility is sealed off by a security AI known as the Red Queen. Uh, She's pretty creepy in and of herself, even though it's it's the image of a child um, that's being portrayed, but it's a very creepy child. (laughs) Um, After everyone is contained... The system begins killing off people that are trapped inside in some pretty horrific ways. 
The vial that was broken contained a substance known as the T-virus, which reanimates the dead, turning them into zombies. And of course, zombies are driven by the need to feed, and the meal of choice is humans. Alice, the main character, awakens in a mansion uh, with amnesia. Before she can determine what is happening, the mansion is set upon by a group of commandos who bring her along with them as they head into the hive. The group has to face several obstacles as they try and fight their way back out. The Red Queen tries to thwart their escape at every turn, not wanting the infection to get out into the populace. Then there's the hordes of zombies that are chasing them. And not only zombies, but there's other creatures that are created down there that are is equally as frightening. Um, I believe one of them was called the Liquor. Uh, it was a giant creature with this huge tongue that was horrific to look at and could climb walls. And it mutates every time that it eats another person. So it gets even scarier as time goes on. But the worst for me were the dog zombies again. I don't know why people have to always bring dogs into this, but I still shudder every time I see those. There's, a, again, a couple of the different aspects of horror that are happening here. There, there's people that are trapped somewhere, so they're trapped underground in the hive and trying to get out. And on top of that, trying to flee from all the creatures that are, are chasing them, plus the artificial intelligence that's also trying to prevent them from getting out. So I found it it was coming at you with a lot of different elements that way. And also, I think in this one, Rain which is played by Michelle Rodriguez, deserves kind of an honorable mention because she was pretty kick-ass in this one, too. Can I just say Michelle Rodriguez is pretty kick-ass in everything. I mean, that woman, uh, I just love her. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. It's, it's pretty much a case of, oh, she's in a movie. Okay, we're going to go watch that. I don't care. It could be about scuba diving. I'll go watch it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'd always watch a movie about scuba diving as well. It's another thing I love to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, <here we> go. <laughs> but I can't watch Jaws anymore because of that. <laughs> Jaws would be better with woman in the car in the in the lead. This is my philosophy of life. Yes. So, but I love. I'm a I'm a big fan of shark movies. Uh, good shark movies. I'm not a big fan of Sharknado. As amusing as the the little shark eating noises of nom 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 <laughs> is, I I think I could live without that. So like. Like Deep Blue Sea, I absolutely love it. And I almost chose it for one of these films, but I didn't like the main female chick. I thought she was a bit of a shrinking violet character, and I'm not a huge fan of those. Like, give me a nice, strong woman character, I'm, I'm there. Nothing will turn me off of a horror movie more than seeing somebody, like, wearing heels. <laughs> or, or <laughs> you know, ah, screaming and running away. <laughs> yeah, like, oh... Uh, some men save me. I'm like, oh, please. Where's Michelle Rodriguez when you need her? I say that a lot, actually. <laughs> Your life mantra. Um, but Resident Evil is absolutely one of my favorite movie series, like, ever. And um, I almost chose the werewolf one with Kate Beckinsale. But I, I felt that there was more action than horror, ultimately. Yeah. Which is why I didn't end up with that one. It's Underworld. Underworld, yes. Underworld. Yes, I had to just um, consult with my movie collection. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for joining me today. All right, so if people want to contact you because you're awesome, like where can they find you on Twitter? What is your, your Twitter handle? Uh, my Twitter handle is at Suli's Killer, which is it's a bit of a weird name. So it's S-O-O-L-I-E-S-K-I-L-L-E-R. So why is it that? So my wife actually, um, she studied this martial art called Kuk Su Wong. And so she always calls herself Kuk Su Lee. So I'm like Suli's killer because that's my nickname that she gave me. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> because lesbian couples are not at all. No, not at all. We're, we're perfectly normal. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm Sheena and I've been joined today by Michelle reviewer at the lesbian review so come and check out some of the cool reviews she's done and check out her favorites list i'll add the links to all the movies we spoke about in the show notes and today we spoke about the 10 best female leads in a horror movie film producers out there can we have some 
lesbian horror movie leads, please, please, please. This is me begging. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to rate us and subscribe. You can do so on iTunes, Podbean or Stitcher. You can find other podcasts on iTunes, Podbean and Stitcher on the Lesbian Talk Show. We do like a million different types of podcasts with a whole bunch of hosts. If you want to support the channel, check out our show notes for our Patreon link. We love our patrons and we give them exclusive content. That's all for this week. Bye. Bye.